They squish painfully beneath his weight. And maybe he doesn't know that it hurts her, maybe he does. What Mr. Chocolate knows for sure is that by walking around on Rosie's tips, he can get her up out of bed and into the kitchen, and then he'll be fed. It's the same thing this morning. Rosie is sound asleep. Mr. Chocolate sniffs at his empty food dish, then goes into the bedroom. He leaps up onto the bed for a stroll on Rosie's tits. Rosie wakes up cursing, throws him aside, and lays there with her face twisted, rubbing the pain away. She picks up her phone from the nightstand, looks at the time, checks messages, and listens to a voicemail from her mother. Hello, Rosie. Your father called this morning, sweet pea. He wanted a new number. I told him that if you wanted him to have it, that you'd call him yourself and give it to him. There's no way that I was going to give it to him. Well, you just wouldn't believe what that rotten son of a bitch called me then. Rosie gets up out of bed shuffles into the kitchen and feeds Mr. Chocolate. She makes herself a pot of coffee and toasts a bagel. Mr. Chocolate gulps his breakfast up in two big slurps and then stretches out on the kitchen floor, watches Rosie sip her coffee and flip through an Italian vogue until the turning pages become irresistible to him. He jumps up onto the table, onto the magazine, and onto Rosie's breakfast. Rosie yells and shoves the fat cat back onto the floor. Mr. Chocolate glares in her, and if looks could kill, she'd be a limp and battered bird, but since they can't, he just goes into the other room and claws to pieces some of Rosie's favorite chair. Abandoning her mess, Rosie brings the magazine into the bathroom, takes off her underpants, and sits down on the toilet. She tugs her tampon out, and it pops down into the water. She finishes with the toilet and pulls the back of the shower curtain. Reaching into the shower, Rosie adjusts both shower nozzles. The hot one a lot and the cold one just a twist. The bathroom begins to fill with steam. Rosie undresses and soaks herself in the water. She feels the massaging heat lead away at the muscles she'd slept on wrong, at Mr. Chocolate in her ruined breakfast, at the message from her mother. She'd been in the shower for a good ten minutes with her eyes closed under soapy foam when she feels the shower curtain sticking to her legs. She peels it off and pushes it away. She sticks her face back in the scalding hot stream and rinses the soap from her eyes. She bends her neck forward, then her middle, touching her toes. She lets the spray shoot down her back and legs through the lengths of hair and... She feels the shower curtain sticking to her legs again. Maybe the cat had gotten the door open and a breeze was coming in. She pulls the curtain off and open and looks. The door is shut tight. The window is closed. The fan is off. She pulls the curtain closed and returns to the scalding spray. She turns a bottle of oatmeal almond body wash upside down over her hand. A blob of fragrant goo squeezes out of her palm with which she makes a lather. The hinge, bald, and socket joints of her arms do what they've been hired to do as her skin begins to smell good, to shine. She starts to wash between her legs. The shower curtain moves in and sticks to her forcefully like someone was on the other side of it trying to fuel her up through the plastic. She swats at it. When it won't go back, she yanks it open. She looks around the bathroom. There isn't anybody there. Just the toilet, just the sink, just the one narrow shelf that holds her makeup bag, her couple of lotions, her torn paperback, Emily Dickinson, and her rose mist spray. Smell roses. <laughs> Beneath the bird bath porcelain sink is the little tin garbage pail with pink flamingos on it, filled with dirty cotton balls, Q-tips, and tampon wrappers. Rosie pulls the curtain shut and goes back into the spray. Her mother's message is on her mind. Rosie knows she's going to have to call her father first thing after a shower to give him her new number and that petty little leverage of power that her mother presently holds over her father, the leverage she revels in, will then be stolen from her so then her mother will most likely give Rosie the cold shoulder for a few days. Both parents love Rosie bigger than Barnum's jumbo elephant but hate each other's guts fervently, tirelessly, and their dirty war with one another keeps Rosie on the constant lamp. She was trying to keep it out of her mind to enjoy her shower when the shower curtain slowly reaches up and sticks to her thigh and against her belly. Rosie backs herself up against the wall tiles, wide eyes clicking, fixed on the curtain. She swats with both hands now, but the curtain doesn't fall away. It stays there, extended forward, floating. 
just an inch of steamy space between them. She steers the hard shower spray at the floating plastic and forces it back. Streams of water run down it. The curtain leans in again in spite of the spray and touches the inside of both their thighs. Rosie slaps at the curtain again, but it quickly returns and plasters itself to the inside of her thighs. She beats it back, but it slides up to her crotch, then her stomach, and then her chest. <laughs> Rosie is panic-stricken, but she reacts quickly with intelligence. She grabs the top left corner of the shower curtain and yanks. Two of the rings pop. She yanks a second time and two more rings pop. The shower curtain starts to unravel from the rod. Stop. The curtain speaks. Please stop. Rosie still holds the plastic in her hands but stops yanking. Yes, yes, that's it. Stop pulling. Stop yanking. Why? Yes, I am. And I talk. Right? Something about the curtain's voice relaxes Rosie. And I like to touch you. It's a seductive tone that hits her like a Valium. <laughs> this is really weird, isn't it? Right? Every morning of every day I watch you. Every night too, sometimes when it's summertime and long hours are hot and sticky, I watch you with your hands all over yourself. She feels strange and comfortably dizzy. And when you shave your legs, I tremble like crazy and I get afraid that you'll see me or sense me trembling in that way. You know the way I mean, right? Am I alive? Yes. Do I mean to any harm? Certainly not. And that's most obvious. Rosie stands there speechless, a pillar of salt. Do I wish to do pleasant things to you? Yes. But I like nothing more than to make you feel really very good. Yes. Allow me just one small gentle touch. You'll see what I mean. This is exciting. But her words thin and vanish. The curtain reaches forward and folds its hem up between her legs, slipping inside of her. Rosie takes a breath and it's lighter than the steam and the steam takes it away. Yes. The curtain moves back and forth slowly on her split as it reaches up and, sl and slips about on her stomach and her shoulders, and she shudders. Isn't it yes? The curtain pushes itself deep inside of her and it moves back and forth. Yes, right? Rosie sucks on the steam. Her head bends down. Boiling beams of water shoot down on the back of her spine. Rosie's legs wobble and her eyes close tight. It's yes, right? Isn't it yes? A corner of the curtain's hem reaches around and slides in between her ass cheeks, tickling her. The lights behind her eyelids glow pink and orange and splash and lava lamp globs from side to side. A little bit of it creeps into her asshole and gently opens it. Right? With its Valium. Suddenly, it leaps into her. A lot of it. It all climbs in quickly and goes in and up and in further and up further, charging through her insides. The lights behind Rosie's eyelids turn from flowery pinks into blasting sparks of red. Her head shoots back and cracks against the tiled wall. Right? Right? You fuck. You fuck, right? In the valley. Just be yes. The detectives know that there's a cat in the apartment because of the food and water dish in the kitchen and because of the litter box near the hallway near the door. The detectives don't give a shit about the cat. They don't even look for the cat. What they give a shit about is the dead girl in the bathroom. Would you look at this foot here? What the hell do you suppose happened to that? She kicked, just like the others. Yeah, only this one must have gotten her foot caught pretty goddamn good on the faucet. Ugh, there's skin on this thing. Great, we've solved the mystery of her foot. Now what about the rest of her? I don't know. But you're right, it's just like the others. The shower curtain stuffed in the mouth, vagina, and anus. And unless the autopsy says any different, and I got an ulcer like feeling it won't, it's another death by ass fixation. And if it is like the others, then there won't be one sole snot drop of semen. No suspect. The forensic scan will come up with ice cube, ice cold zero. Well. For sure what we knew before, serial killer. He's damn good too, whoever he is, and smart. We're gonna find a whole heap more of these girls before we find a fucking clue. Yeah, it's the television. 
Found in a university for these fucking creeps. In any case, the mayor's gonna chop off balls in the department. The press already has their fat noses filled with a good whiff of this thing. It's grandma's hot peach pie on an open window sill, and we're the pimply faced boys at the blackboard with stiff hard ons and no answers. This is bad. <laughs> People don't like a serial killer at home. They like them when they're in some other town, some other city, when it's just sick news to see it, to feed their sick suburban fantasies. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Great Ryan, everybody. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you liked it. To be fair, we talked ourselves down from the. That's like the second most disturbing story in the book. I was really worried about it.